All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is David Duncan. I'm the uh, open source Linux lead for Solutions Architects at Amazon uh, in the Amazon Web Services group. Uh, and I want to talk to you today a little bit about um, running the uh, Amazon EC2 container service and uh, specifically uh, running that with Fedora Atomic. Let's pause for a second and let <laughs> people get in. So we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, just cluster management in general, scheduling a little bit, uh, running the services. Uh, then I'll uh, walk through adding the ECS agent to uh, Fedora Atomic and uh, that should get you up to the point that you can actually start working with a cluster. So I'm not going to go into a lot of the detail around containers and, and the, the uh, container building itself because I'm assuming that almost everyone in here is pretty comfortable with, the, with that side of the business. We'll stick to what's happening on the AWS side and lower that barrier to entry. So uh, why containers? It's easy for microservices. This is sort of a natural natural platform for microservices. Um, one of the things that happens in the public cloud, obviously, is that a lot of the standard um, applications and, and some of the uh, simpler processes are abstracted away, and it makes it very easy to work with for a lot of people who are looking for um, a public cloud process. So, uh, just building containers obviously is uh, fairly straightforward and um, that part we don't, like I said, I'm not going to emphasize today, uh, but what is hard is getting them scheduled and this is a challenge to a lot of um, businesses that come to us and they want to know how they're going to handle that. Um, we want to make sure that you have sort of an intelligent way to, to, um, to manage those containers figure out what instances you have available, et cetera. So we start with the uh, EC2 instance. The EC2 instance itself is going to be the base for what you're running Docker on. Um, inside of uh, the Docker, we're, we're going to separate out the specific containers and groups of containers and groups of uh, and, and storage into what we call a task definition. So when you run a task definition, that is basically what's running in the um, uh, as a as a solid group um, for container management. So we're using this to basically track just the CPU, memory, and uh, networking resources that are available for containers. So the scheduler is responsible for. Um, the tasks and their and their execution. Um, once we uh, have the task defined, we'll use a we use a scheduler. Actually, we use a couple of schedulers um, to um, to manage those and place them in exactly where you want. <coughs> so. We have a cluster management engine that underlines the service, All right, so there's no requirement for you to actually touch that. Uh, you're just going to leverage it for, for utilization. So uh, what we're going to talk about ultimately is the ECS agent. And the ECS agent is what's running on each one of the individual container instances. So uh, what you would refer to as uh, a, a standard instance, in this case, running the ECS agent becomes the container instance. Um, there is a uh, agent communication service and an API that's available here uh, that's going to talk directly to the ECS agent. So the ECS agent actually wraps a lot of the Docker uh, commands so that they have uh, almost native access to the EC2 container service API. So 
So basically what we do in order to coordinate this is we provide a uh, key value store underneath, although uh, this is kind of the heart of uh, the process and keeps the, um, uh, the cluster state available across all of the container instances. So uh, maintaining that at scale is a really big deal. So we're going to take a look at exactly how we maintain that. So um, this is sort of a description of a, of a, um, a fairly simple transactional algorithm, right? Uh, but what happens in the, uh, in the key value store is we're storing only writes that are handled after the last read. Right. So, um, if if your uh, if your system well, if we read a key value, right, a key value pair, then that key value pair becomes the um, the the snapshot that we we base our next write on. So you never get out of order. Right. Uh, so if you have multiple clients and they're all doing writes and they're all doing reads. Um, you actually end up in positions where if I have a system that's read at say n plus 2 tries to write at n plus 3 but I have another scheduler right say transactional event that occurs at n plus 5 then the only place that that will actually be available to write is at the n plus 6 step so this allows us to have uh, sort of a combination of events occurring from different locations all talking to the same API. That API then goes back to the cluster manager and ensures that everything stays same. So looking at it in, ac in action here we have the API, the agent communication service, all talking to the cluster management engine all uh, sanity checking done by key value store uh, and this is done across uh, a range of availability zones and so you can actually um, you can maintain a, an entire cluster across a span of, of uh, high latency communication data centers single region single region yeah it's always single region there are ways of spanning it but uh, when you define a cluster you're always defining it in a specific region and that's by design. So one of the principles of the AWS um, configuration is that every every region is independently active. So how does that work if you want a service that is multi-region? So so you're, if you want a service that's multi-region, we tend to suggest that you actually create a system that is singularly regional, right? So it's, a, it's a, across one single region, but then uh, make those latency-based, make latency-based communications across, across the, uh, for clients, so that if you have clients who are, who are hitting systems, they're actually hitting what's, what's most local to them. You can also uh, create restrictions uh, based on what, what uh, geographic locations you have if that is critical to your to your business case. Okay, so with the API, you can choose whatever scheduler it is that you want want to use. If you have your own scheduler, you can actually leverage this API, and this is all open source. In fact, I'll show you where it is on GitHub in just a second. Um, to actually make make uh, requests for CP for resources, and then uh, run those tasks, or run tasks accordingly. Tasks, of course, being combinations of containers and storage. So here I'm just showing multiple schedulers, right? So you have multiple schedulers, multiple resources. Um, you can schedule a task by any one of these. You know, this could be this could be a long-running service application uh, task scheduler. 
This one could be for, for batch operations. Each one of them could be working at vastly different rates. And uh, the uh, cluster management and scheduler is, go is going to keep, keep that in check, right? So your cluster management is always going to look back to the key value store, verify that these resources have not already been allocated or they've been freed um, prior to the actual deployment. And then uh, your scheduler is free to work as it chooses. So this is just demonstrating that same thing we had in the algorithm uh, review there that if, if, our, if scheduler yellow <laughs> is trying to access uh, resources that are already being provided from uh, scheduler blue, then there's, uh, uh, there's always going to be a, a prevention that, for that occurring. So, uh, Basically, we get a full-scale shared state system that you can provide your own scheduler for. You can uh, allocate resources as you see necessary. You have uh, your instances, the container instances that you're, are actually providing all of these resources can, can then be auto-scaled. So you don't necessarily have a single group of container in, of instances that are associated with uh, your cluster resources that can literally scale up and scale down. All of your central control and monitoring is happening through the cluster scheduler or through the cluster management system. And so the scheduler can function independently of that and just provide information back and forth. So <clears throat> these are uh, some of the scale out numbers that, we, that we've, uh, we've actually pushed from our own cluster. Um, so looking at this, you can see that we can scale up fairly quickly uh, a number of nodes. Um, <clears throat> where, uh, you know, a, sort of a singularly allocated system would provide you sort of a flat number. Just reiterate that, you know, with the schedulers, we have two, di two specific schedulers that are there by default. One is for long-running services, so you're going to actually have a service definition that's associated with that. And then the other is just for batch jobs, so if you want to run a single job that's just going to take resources up for, for uh, some period of time, like something that's related to cleanup for after a backup process, then uh, there's a scheduler that actually handles that, those resources as well. Obligatory slide. There's all sorts of other services out there that this touches and makes it really easy to integrate those back into whatever it is that you're working on. So if you do want to pull that out. Um, so the elastic load balancing is a really easy one to, to point out how that inter interfaces with this because each one of your containers is going to present either TCP or UDP from, uh, from, this, from the container instance. Each one of those uh, ports can then be attached to a single elastic load balancer and you can actually scale out your service whatever your task definition is you can actually uh, scale that out behind a single load balancer so then you're not just provisioning an instance you're provisioning a container behind a load balancer so the load balancer itself is just making uh, communications with the single container that's that's driving whatever service it is that you're accessing from there that service then if it becomes non-responsive, the container, is, uh, the, the task itself is actually um, destroyed, not the container instance. If a container instance is destroyed, the tasks are then actually re reattached to the ELB when they're, when they're um, expanded, they're scaled out based on the scaling group. So, this is where you go to see the open source side of this. Um, the CLI here is uh, completely open source. The ECS agent is completely available, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your feedback and uh, uh, finding out how we can better serve the atomic community. I'm going to pause there while you.
So the other thing about having those is open source and makes it very easy to sort of pull them into a standard CI CD process. If you have something that's already going with your Docker files through GitHub, whatever, you can actually roll that right into your process uh, and have those instances just turn. Actually, you can actually provision based upon your process, and you can have multiple clusters that do different things. So, if you had like a test versus a prod cluster, you could have one that was that had a scaling group that stayed at, at one container instance versus uh, a uh, production one which scaled out to a much larger um, audience. Okay, so. Now we'll look a little bit closer at what the task definition is. So, like I said, the, the, a task is gonna be something that's actually handled by a container. So, uh, if you're looking at how that, um, how that your, your task is gonna run, that, that's gonna be fine, you're gonna find that in the task definition. The task definition also includes Storage, so you can you can I actually identify how your your uh, storage is associated with this particular container, um, and then your uh, your run command yeah. in that definition altogether will will um, then define what resources will be allocated by the scheduler for any given uh, instance of that task. Yes, and the storage can be backed by. EBS, S3. EBS or Elastic File System, yeah, no, no S3. Yeah. I mean, you can access S3 programmatically, but then that's not not the same as having a, a storage, a block storage. Can someone bring their own? So, like for example, if somebody wanted to run Bluster, and you can do that too. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I mean, technically, you could run Ceph. I, don't know why you want to in this context, but but you but you could do it, and uh, Glust, but Gluster is a great fit. So just looking in the graphic interface at what you're actually defining for each one of these individual tasks, you can see uh, the um, just the the defining metadata, uh, the port mappings, which are really critical, and then down here you're actually um, uh, associating a specific number of CPU units. Um, there are 1024 to, to, uh, to start with and, and you're basically gonna, going to um, divide that up accordingly as you see fit. So it can be a little bit more granular. You can actually make some more definite uh, uh, stronger definitions around the, uh, the environment and your Docker run commands, uh, but that's typically not necessary as long as you allocate uh, what resources you need uh, if you've got a defined container with, with, your, with your standard commands in there, you'll, you'll get what you need with the run command. If you want to override your run, you can do that in the advanced configuration. And yeah, it comes out in JSON can define it that way too. Okay, so each one of these tasks is scheduled onto a container instance and uh, that is essentially what happens here. So a container instance itself doesn't necessar isn't necessarily consumed by a single task, right? You've got 1024 units to, to divide up, but you can identify how many, how many units you're gonna associate with any given task and then auto scale accordingly. So we're looking at it from this uh, from that perspective, right? So a task actually defines a unit of work. This is going to be associated with specific containers, one or more. And then uh, the uh, the actual resources that you're expecting to, to associate with that particular target. Right. 
Okay, so now here's what I said. For a long-running application, you're going to create specifically a service. And the service is going to refer to something that you want to keep running at all times, right? So now uh, we can associate that service then with a specific load balancer, and that load balancer then will scale uh, out the back end to make sure that it's actually uh, providing sufficient workload, right? So you can have a load balancer auto scaling group, and that load balancer then uh, will have whatever whatever uh, triggers you actually identify are going to make it possible for you to uh, maintain the serviceability of the of this application or this task group. That just re reiterates exactly what I just said. So another thing is you can actually have a container instance configuration that you've defined then you reiterate that. This is kind of very helpful in the context of, of Atomic, right? So where we're actually going in with the uh, OS tree and, and, and literally um, moving to a different, in, different version of the environment, right? So uh, we can take a machine image that we've created for our old, our new environment and add that to our stack. So now we actually have sort of a, a, a standard um, uh, kind of red light, green light uh, deployment here because we've got multiple, multiple auto scaling groups. Each one of those auto scaling groups is associated with a particular version of the OS. We can drain connections out of the old systems. And once we have those completely drained, we can actually go back to a full full new deployment. So now all of this is the new infrastructure. Nothing is left of the old infrastructure. It's all scaled down. Um, none of the connections were actually dropped, right, because the old, the old infrastructure was there at the same time. We just remove the DNS entries that are associated with the older instances. So anything that's, that's still running still serviced. Once there's no service on those, no service load on the old instances, they can just go away. That makes sense. All right, so now we're just going to look at code. <laughs> just relax. So, um, for grabbing the most recent atomic instance, uh, I use the JMES path query that's associated with the AWS CLI. Um, so grabbing minus one is the easiest, the fastest and easiest way to get it um, if you sort by creation date. So once I have that machine image, I'm going to do a run instance command. The run instance command I'm going to associate with, a, with whatever size instance I think is representative of of um, my test environment. So it could be just a T2 micro, right? Or, um, but I, cho I generally choose a small because um, either a small or a large gives you a, a sustained bandwidth. And uh, I, pref I prefer that. I prefer to have the sustained bandwidth or something measurable rather than having something that's just. Uh, subject to steal time. How do they stop you as an Amazon employee from always grabbing the largest instance that you could possibly want? I'm just curious. Where is it up to your well, personal so, discretion? Yeah. Well, so it's, yeah, so one of our basic principles, what, what's that? Repeat the class. Oh, so, so uh, how, did, how do they stop a, a, just an Amazon employee from grabbing the biggest instance they possibly can? Yeah, so why, are we, why am I not running everything on a GP2 and an, I, an I2 instances? Um, so frugality, that's the, yeah, that's the Amazon value that I would say associates mostly with that. Yeah. <laughs> Don't want the phone call from Jeff. We see you missing GP2. <laughs> Well, I have my own billing alerts set up so that I know what I am spending. Yeah, so I certainly don't want to don't want to spend much time. And you know, I literally, 
in, so you can you can if you want to schedule it so that all your instances just are are turned off at a specific time every day. Um, that's you know totally possible. Um, not that I do that, but I do find myself occasionally on my phone looking and thinking, oh, I should have turned that off. <laughs> Okay, so uh, once I have that, uh, once I have a, uh, a running instance, I'm going to attach to that instance and just update it, right? So just pull, uh, the, just update the OS tree. I'm going to, I'm going to go to latest. Uh, then I'm going to um, grab the ECS agent from uh, the Docker registry, right? Easy enough to do. Um, once I have that, um, now I want to. I can create the EC, the ECS optimized on. Right. I didn't see that command there, but there's maybe it's on the next one. No. Okay. So I used a very like a couple of different directions to, with the CLI, so you can see a couple things here. Um, there's a create image call that I made that I. Don't, I didn't, don't think I actually recorded on this, this slide. Um, so at this point, you would want to run a create image so that you have the, uh, the current version of Atomic, the current version of the ECS agent all together. So we'll call that one, our machine image is going to keep, is going to maintain that, right? So there's a couple of other commands that are associated there in the uh, on on the GitHub repo. If you if you read the notes, there's a couple of directories that have to be created um, for logging and um, the config. But once you have that, uh, once you have those created, you want to create the image. So pull all the pull all the new, create the two directories that are necessary. And then run a create image uh, for this particular um, this particular instance, right? So <clears throat> actually, uh, here when I did a run instance, I made sure to change my instance initiated shutdown behavior to stop instead of terminate, so that in the event that something went wrong, I'd still have the instance there available for me. Um, uh, for for creating the image. Okay, so here I've actually generated a small CLI skeleton, and that's just a JSON structure uh, for defining any of the things that are associated with a particular uh, command. So any of the parameters that are associated can be collected into one of those skeletons, and then you can place that in a template. That template then can be used to run the command consistently, and you can just make updates to that template rather than actually uh, having to um, uh, type this out. <laughs> and those work great with Bodo, so you don't, you don't necessarily you can you can manage them programmatically after that. Once you have a skeleton that, uh, or a CLI configuration that you you've generated, uh, you can then make modifications to that programmatically. Okay, so now uh, using that in the CLI input JSON uh, parameter, I've actually created a cluster. Now, I've given this cluster a name of production because that's what we all do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay, there we go. Yeah, so uh, taking that instance that we actually updated we're going to run this create image to get that image, uh, the, uh, the ID over there that's associated with the, um, the uh, volume and the, and the uh, instance definition. If you have, so the great thing about this is if you decide to allocate more storage, right, like you add more devices uh, into your configuration, then those devices will be recreated with each one of those images. So if you're using Let's say, uh, let's say you've identified uh, devs that you've put in your Docker storage setup, 
and then you add like SDB, SDC, whatever. Um, that configuration can remain each time you create an, an instance of this machine image you actually end up with the same storage configuration so you're uh, keeping consistency, consistency with your own image. So <clears throat> I'm creating the image or I'm creating an actual in, an instance here. I could have done this through an auto scaling group, but I chose to do to do it as a single instance because it's easier, more clear. So <clears throat> now I have one uh, one instance with the default configuration for this particular uh, region. So I shell in, start the container. So do a Docker run on the on the actual configuration. Now, this is the important part. <laughs> There's a there is a uh, connection to the uh, to the uh, Unix socket there, and that requires you to run privileged. So thanks Dan Walsh for fixing that, <laughs> so that we could actually do it. This is not a solution. This is a workaround, but. The dash dash privileged dash dash net equals host is a requirement for running the actual um, agent. If you don't have that in place, then the agent will just fail and it'll fail repeatedly and uh, you won't have an attached instance. Once that ECS agent is running, it's associated with the cluster. Oh, I'm sorry. There's one more thing that's associated here. Um, The ECS underscore cluster environment variable. There's a ton of environment variables in the uh, in the uh, readme for the for the actual agent, but this one in particular associates it with uh, a defined cluster. So if you have um, you always have a default cluster. If you just start instances that are associated with with uh, the EC2 container service, then they will by definition associate with a the default cluster and that's what its name is um, so so if you just start up and and uh, run the ACS agent you're running on the default cluster you can actually define services that are associated with that but if you do like I did and create your own cluster then you need to actually specify in the run command what cluster they should attach to what what cluster those instances should attach So here you see a specific container instance. Where we, this is really where we're ready to define our, our, uh, our tasks, associate those with services, and then provide uh, metrics for which they can, they can scale. That's all I have. Any questions? So the way you walk through looked fairly manual having to SSH, SSH into the thing and set everything. You can do that so programmatically. Right? I could have done, yeah, so there's two ways, there's two ways to handle that. Uh, the first way and the most standard way, the, the atomic way, uh -huh. is via the cloud init. Okay. Right? So configuring, configuring the actual Docker command, I expect to be done in cloud init. Yeah. The other, the second way, and the way that I feel like is gaining traction, and I'm really excited about, is uh, the simple services manager. So, simple service management actually allows you to make um, programmatic or gain programmatic access to the to the ser to the instance without having to provide an SSH login. So, it's done through it's done through the metadata. The ELB configuration, you, you said that you associate that with a service that's running on Fedora Atomic Instances. So the service would be defined in a task. Those mm -hmm. tasks would be running on the Fedora Atomic so Instances. So it, it scales the service, but does it also tag the back end 
Fedora Atomic instances for scale. So the cluster would actually have its own CloudWatch metrics that were associated with that. So if you were running low on resources, you could actually scale the, the scaling group. That's, so when you define instances, you can, do, you can define instances one of two ways for uh, the uh, EC2 container service. You either define them individually or you create an auto scaling group that has a scaling configuration that includes that image type. Then you provide uh, the, so the launch configuration has the instance and the associated army, and then your, uh, the auto scaling group actually has the metrics on which you. So there's just scale. some coordination happening. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's also a uh, cluster scheduler open source or is it like something you're, uh, like you're in Yeah, that's the special, that's the abstracted part that's that's sort of the public cloud service, right? Is that in, uh, while the API itself is open and available for you, for use, the key value store is, um, is the secret sauce. Uh, so, uh, you presented uh, running Fedora Atomic Host yes, uh, with uh, your agent. So my question is, uh, it's possible to do a hybrid uh, uh, Docker cluster with your Amazon container service? Because uh, you're providing uh, just containers, yes, in uh, Amazon? Or I'm in this thing? No, we provide uh, Zen virtual machines. In EC2. In EC2. Yeah. Yeah, not, not strictly containers. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, your scheduler and key value store are... So the scheduler, we, so we have the, uh, the scheduler itself is, is uh, um, yeah, it's not disclosed right in itself sure. for, for the for the service the associated services uh -huh. but the API is available to actually put whatever scheduler you want to put in place so if you had something that was doing bin packing right or, um, mesos right you wanted to add that on top or even if you wanted so I was going to say like what if I'm what if I'm using Amazon along with something else and my environment's based on EC2 or uh, sorry etcd and Gonna, how do these play together? So they kind of play in the same space, right? So this is the, <laughs> I mean, uh, so I don't, without getting too much into the to comparison, what I will yeah. say is that when the EC2 container service was being developed, uh -huh. we had a lot of customers that we were talking to who were saying, okay, so we want to get into the container space, yeah. but we don't want to be in the, in the business of managing our cluster. Right. Right. So uh, this was a, a decided uh, move to create an abstraction okay. so that so that we could eliminate the requirement to do both. But provide an open API so that if you decided you wanted to do both, you would have the ability to actually provide uh, back some numbers. Right. So some some details of the scheduling. Now, as far as the SCD goes, there's already a key value store here. Mm -hmm. Um, you could leverage that, and you wouldn't wouldn't necessarily require it. Have you seen but people plug uh, Kubernetes into your key value? Personally, I have not. Okay. But I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> yes. Just a general observation. I, I, I'm not necessarily signing anyone up for work, but I would be yes. interested in speaking. <laughs> Joe said that already. Um, it would be interesting for me from an atomic perspective to help eliminate the step that you had to go through where you docker pull the latest version of your agent and then I have to save a new image like that. I think I assume okay you're nodding as well. Yes it would be nice it would be nice if there was an army that was just it's 100%. atomic with the and we have ways of yeah. potentially caching those so that's fantastic. Yeah okay. so we have I'll, I'll talk I, Yeah that's great and and that's actually something that I was really I mean that's really what what I wanted to why I wanted to talk about this is okay. because I th I think there's a great opportunity here for some for some strong momentum uh, in ECS optimized uh, in an ECS optimized image. Uh, we have we have that in a couple of different places, right? So the way that the so uh, obviously there's a lot of 
strong tie in between EC2. Sure. Yeah, no, no, Surprise. Yeah. But uh, so, so. Thank you from an open source perspective. Yeah, exactly. And that's exactly where I'm coming from as well, right? Is that I want to see, I want to see this strong adoption of Fedora yeah. Atomic in this right. space. We have, we have people who remind us that every, every additional step to get onboarded, you know, you lose 90% of people, so. Precisely, and, and that's exactly what I want to do, is take, take this opportunity to provide people with a very simple level playing field uh, for, for uh, defining Docker-related tasks. How, how big community is behind uh, the uh, open source project, or is it all developed uh, by Amazon and just open source? So obviously, we maintain the repo, yeah. uh, but pull requests are accepted. <laughs> yeah, no, very happy to have partic strong participation. Um, we have probably about 15 strong contributors right now, I think, from the outside, and then uh, team, a dedicated team. Have you also tried this on uh, stock for the world? Well. Yes, uh, so Stock Fedora was the first thing that I actually deployed uh, EC2 container service with. And uh, that, would, that was just um, super easy. Obviously, same problem exists, right, which is that you have multiple steps that you have to go through in order to, to, um, to get there. And ultimately, I would like to see an ECS optimized image. We, we would love to have somebody from Amazon participate in the cloud work group. I'm right here. Happen. I'm right here. <laughs> <laughs> um, we yeah. patches accepted, as they say. Yeah. By the way, you have five minutes to take more questions. Excellent. Anybody else? Any general questions? I mean, while I'm standing up here? Um, why does the ECS agent run as a Docker image and not just a regular image? So it'll run, uh, it'll run both, so it'll run both ways. And it could be, it could literally be included uh, in, in the base OS. Um, there is a there is a configuration for that. It's it's just a Go package, right? So uh, it lends itself to being run as a container because this is Fedora Atomic and not Fedora proper, right? The the uh, the idea was to follow Collins' tenants, right, and ensure that it's uh, that it's running in the in the appropriate package model. But it's it's all open source, so if we wanted to roll that into the image, do you have any idea like how many, how much that would add size wise? If we roll that into the A line. I think an eleven meg, maybe. So not inconsiderable, not Emacs. Yeah, not Emacs. <laughs> Is that that's your yardstick? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm just thinking. I'm just basing this on. A container size off yeah. the top of my head, okay. but if it it might be smaller if you've got all of your libraries in, in one place. Mm -hmm. That's a guess. Okay. Anything else? Cool. Thanks, guys. Cool.